Welcome back everyone to week three, part one of lecture one. We're going to learn about multiple linear regression analysis. So when do you use multiple linear regression analysis? Well, you use it in the same sort of circumstances where you used uh, simple linear regression analysis. You want to predict one variable from another. Uh, the difference now being you have more than one predictor. Pretty much the rest of it's the same. So uh, multiple linear regression just means you have multiple predictors for a single DV uh, that you're predicting. Oh yeah, the usual disclaimer in every stats class, of course. So for example, you want to see which variables that are listed below are the best predictors of college students' current alcohol, uh, average alcoholic drinks consumed per week. Your DV, which is sort of a weird name because it's not like a normal DV, but it is the thing you're predicting, so they call it a DV in SPSS, is the average number of alcoholic drinks consumed per week by people. And you have eight potential predictors. So eight potential IVs or predictors. Um, there's something called the family uh, conflict score of the family environment scale. So how much conflict there was in their family and its interval. Their parental drinking inventory score, also interval. And then three through eight are different parenting styles of both the mother and of the father from the CPBI, which I can't remember what that is. Some, that last, the I is inventory. P's parent. Um, so for the mother, you have three subscales, permissive, authoritarian, and authoritative. And then you have those same ones for the father, permissives, authoritarian, and authoritative. And we want to know, hey, uh, which combination of these things is the best predictors of how hammered college students get? So you get data from 298 undergraduate students. This is someone's actual dissertation including measures of drinking and their parents rearing practices and lo and behold we start with the big old correlation matrix note that that first column column one there and that this sometimes confuses people the one through eight up above stand for the variables um like one is average drinks it's got one next to it two is family conflict four is permissiveness so why isn't nine up top well um nine with nine is just a, a um a dash so that's why you don't need it all right so that first column though is the thing you want to predict right it's average drinks how hammered call students get and so uh, remember last semester we sort of looked down there and found the one that has the biggest correlation so that's probably what we're doing again which variables do we think will be the best predictors of current average weekly alcohol consumption based on the correlation matrix Kind of looking at it, so I see a, neg a 0.28, a 0.25, a 0.18, and those are the only three that are statistically significant in column one that is uh, correlated with average drinks. So I would guess uh, the strongest correlation. So drinking inventory followed by permissiveness and of the mother and then permissiveness of the father. So drinking inventory, permissiveness of the mother, permissiveness of the father. So it's how permissiveness is um, um, like they didn't have a lot of rules and things like that. But it's worth noting here that permissiveness of the mother and father are also correlated. So there is a 0.32 correlation between uh, the permissiveness of the mother and the father. Mothers who were more per permissive tended to be with fathers who were more permissive. So it suggests um, that there, those two things might be a little bit redundant. The fact that they're so strongly correlated suggests that they might be redundant so they might not both be needed for prediction but everything is positively correlated here so um, let's keep rolling so how do we actually determine which variables are the most important for predicting their college students drinking so um because predictors overlap this is a little bit different than last semester um, and actually the, the short answer is SPSS is going to do it <laughs> That, that, that's what's going to happen. But note that because variables overlap, like the permissiveness of the mother and the father, sometimes you don't need both of those things, and SPSS helps you get rid of them. So um, it figures it out using this procedure called multiple regression. This is probably the most common thing used for dissertations. And so here we have a little example of variability and the three predictors. So the big sort of greenish circle is student drinking. Notice that the parental drinking inventory overlaps with that. 
um, and that part that is just parental drinking inventory um, that overlaps with student drinking but not with mother's permissiveness is what it predicts of student drinking. It's kind of like it's it's R squared. That's what it would be. But not that there's a little bit of overlap between parental drinking and mother's permissiveness as well, but not that much. Um, <clears throat> look at uh, mother and father permissiveness. They overlap a lot, right? So they um, they both have their own little piece of, of student drinking that they predict, but then they have this shared piece. So they have what we call the unique variability, that is the, the variability in student drinking that they uniquely predict. And then there is this overlapping variability that either one could predict. Um, <clears throat> so uh, maybe you don't need them both. Let's see. So what are the goals? Um, this is not going to be shocking. Um, prediction. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is actually how you know Geico uh, when you fill out the little online form and it tells you what your your quote is for your insurance. This is how they figure that out. They put a bunch of stuff in. They ask you how many miles did you have to work, how old you are, what zip code you're in, and they do that because they know the the average crash rates of zip codes. And they put all the stuff in a big regression equation and they're predicting the the uh, uh, how many crashes you're likely to get in. That's what they use this for. This is a very, very common procedure. So um, <clears throat> you can also use it for explanation instead of uh, just prediction. Explanation is when um, you're actually sort of testing theories using multiple regression by putting one variable in and then saying, well, once I put this in, um, the next one isn't going to predict much, showing that this variable is more important. It's kind of, you can use it kind of ANCOVA E. Why am I getting so many damn emails? It's crazy. So, um, so that's explanation. So you want to know which variables are most strongly associated with binge, binge drinking, for example. So sample size, this is because uh, this semester you are working on dissertation proposals. And one of the things that you will be asked is uh, how big of a sample size. How many people do you need to collect data for? So I start covering that moving forward. Um, yeah, largest bit is better as a rule. Um, for prediction, you need at least 40 subjects per predictor. So for each IV, each variable you might want to use to predict, you need 40 subjects. So um, uh, think about like the uh, Neo PI with its five subscales. Let's say you were going to use the Neo PI subscales to predict something. Well, that's five times four. That's going to be 200 um, <coughs> uh, participants you need to collect data from to do that because it's 40 per predictor and there's five subscales. So 40 times five, I think I'm doing the math right. So um, here is sort of the other rule. Other way to do it is you need at least 50 and then eight for each predictor is another sort of uh, formula that's out there. Um, so uh, if you're gonna use regression, you need at least 50 and then for each predictor you're gonna have, you need at, uh, eight additional people. So for the example of eight predictors that we are, uh, we just talked about for uh, college students getting hammered, you need 50 plus eight times eight or 114 participants. So the assumptions are a little bit funky. Uh, absence of outliers. So outliers, again, are really extreme scores. They have uh, Z-scores that are two or bigger um, when we talked about them last semester. Um, <clears throat> here, uh, yeah, I put two, three or bigger. <laughs> Lovely. So, um, um, so they're still really far out their scores, uh, but I guess uh, the rule here for um, regression is they got to be even further out there. Three standard deviations is something um, that would would occur uh, less than one percent of the time just by chance. Instead of uh, uh, two two standard deviations or z score two would be less than five times out of a hundred by chance. So whatever. I think I'm just being nice here. So note that there's univariate outliers, which you're kind of familiar with. So a univariate outlier is, is uh, you know, one score is really weird compared to the others. But um, the other part of the assumption here is not only that you don't have single weird scores, but when you put two variables together, you also don't have really weird sort of far out there things. So we call that a multivariate because it's multiple variables at the same time. So what am I talking about? Well, um, you know, if you saw someone's salary at $60,000 in your study, it wouldn't seem unusual. But what if you you also saw that their age was 12? You'd say, whoa, that's weird. 12-year-olds don't make 60000 right? So um, putting the two variables together, you end up with a weird value. That's a multivariate outlier. And the assumption is that 
Um, none of the predictors and none of the, the, the DV also doesn't have any univariate or multivariate outliers. There's some called Mal Mahalanobis distance you can use. It's in SPSS. So multicollinearity and singularity, I don't think we've talked about recently, but this is when your predictors overlap a lot. Um, multicollinearity is when they um, most, mostly overlap. Um, and so they're kind of redundant into uh, singularity is when they perfectly overlap. So multicollinearity is when the predictors are very highly correlated with each other. And high here is 0.9 or higher, which is really highly correlated, right? They're basically the same darn variable if they're correlated that strongly. And singularity is when the predictors are just literally redundant. Uh, one of the predictors is a combination of two or more of the others. So this happens, for example, uh, if you try to use uh, the subscales and also the total score as predictors in a model. Well, the total score is the sum of the subscales. So you, you can't use both the total score and the subscales because they perfectly predict, subscales perfectly predict the total score. So um, the example here is uh, you can't use total IQ and also the Wexler subscales at the same time in a prediction equation. It'll, it'll SPSS will literally crash because um, you have this singularity problem. So anyway, two weird assumptions, but um, I think you can deal with them. So then we have our, our, our friend normality. So um, normality is, you know, each, each uh, uh, the DV is approximately normally distributed for each uh, particular value of a predictor. Um, <clears throat> oh, look, now we have skewness. <laughs> you want, uh, to look at your skewness value, and you want that to be less than two, but outliers can um, uh, have to be less than three, absolute value. Um, I don't think, we haven't done this one since we did regression last time. It's linearity. That is, uh, remember we were making tons of scatter plots last semester. This just says that a straight line does a good job of representing the relationship between two variables. That's called linearity. You, what do you do? You do a scatter plot to check it. Why is it an assumption? Uh, look at the name at the top of the, uh, the sheet here. It's multiple linear regression. It uses a line. That's why the assumption is a line does a good job. So do a scatter plot. Oh, here's a fancy one. We did do this one last semester, homoskedasticity of residuals. So if you remember, homoskedasticity is that your prediction is equally crappy for all values of X. So um, it doesn't sort of grow or you get worse as you get further out in, in uh, along the number line or something like that. And um, the assumption here is that whatever, um, however bad or good your prediction is, it's equal for all values of X, all values of the predictor. So there's something called a residual. You know, what, when you're predicting stuff, you, you start with uh, known person's values, like in this this example, we know how hammered these people get on average per week. And, um, but we're gonna build a model that's gonna predict that. We're gonna see how well we can predict it and not using um, the fact that we know their, um, uh, how hammered they get each week, their average drinks per week. But then uh, what, what you predict from the model will differ somewhat from what uh, their actual drinking was on average per week. Could just be a fraction or it could be big. Um, and remember, uh, uh, on average, uh, well, let me skip that part. So the difference between what you predict and what their actual score is, is called a residual. And so point that out. So if your prediction is uh, similarly good or poor for all levels of the DV, then this assumption is met. So how do you build models? So um, this is actually kind of fun, I think. Oops, I think people actually like doing this. So um, SPSS builds different models for you and you just use criterion to pick the best one. So it's actually, it's kind of fun. So um, your choice of what models uh, uh, has to do with how overlapping variability that's shared by predictors um, ends up being included in the model. So which doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but basically here's the different methods. One is, is the default is called enter. And it just throws all the predictors in and makes a model and says, here, I made a model to predict the DV based on everything. Um, they, uh, the predictors are entered in the model, uh, comes up with that equation thing from last semester, but it's got multiple Bs in it now. And um, that's it. So another way to do it 
All right, so why enter isn't the best is sometimes um, there's variables that don't actually do a whole lot of predicting. So if you look at our original correlation matrix, only three of the eight variables were even correlated with drinking, right? So why would you want to use all eight? That seems kind of goofy. So there's other, other methods to have SPSS pick a model, and one is called stepwise. So stepwise starts with no predictors in your model, um, and then it adds uh, predictors or takes them out one at a time moving forward. So it will first start with no predictors uh, predicting uh, your DV. Then it'll add the one that has the strongest single correlation um, that uh, predicts the, the biggest chunk of unique variability. Then it goes back and it, it sort of reruns and sees what's left over in terms of variability in your DV. And it says, all right, do any of these other things do a good job of predicting? Um, and if so, it'll add that and then it'll uh, sort of recalibrate again and see if there's a third variable it, it can add that um, adds basically to the R squared, if you remember R squared. So um, one thing about stepwise is uh, sometimes you add a variable, like a third predictor or whatever, and suddenly the thing you added at step one isn't working anymore. It doesn't do any predicting. Stepwise will actually take that variable out. So it both puts variables in as predictors and takes them out. As opposed to backwards, um, <clears throat> backwards starts the opposite of stepwise, um, and it only moves in one direction. What it does is it starts with all the predictors in the model. So it starts with the enter. Uh, it says, uh, I'm just going to throw everything in here and see how well I can predict this thing. And then it takes out the junk, one variable at a time. So it throws everything in, it takes out a variable that does the worst job of predicting, kind of re-crunches re the numbers and says, all right, are any of these other variables junky? Takes that one out, re-crunches the numbers, and then it stops taking variables out when everything that's left over does a good job of predicting your DB. Your DB. So, um, and uh, the, this is one of these cases where the alpha level is different than normal. It actually uh, uses an alpha level of 0 0.10 to remove predictors from your model. Just point that out. So there are other methods. There's forward, which we'll talk about in a week or so. Uh, and so just so you know, there are other methods, but these three are enough for um, getting into this. So there are criteria that you use to evaluate what is the best regression model. So you can say, I mean, you can have SPSS run a enter, run a backwards, run a stepwise. And so how do you know which is the best model to pick? Well, that's what we wanna talk about right now. So criteria number one is your R squared. So remember last semester is little R squared. Now it's big R squared. It's instead of just coefficient of determination, it's coefficient of multiple determination. It's the overall amount of variability that all the predictors together can account for in your DV. So um, together, it's big R because it's multiple uh, uh, predictors at the same time. What proportion of variability uh, can they predict in the DV? So all things being equal, um, a bigger R squared is a, a better model, right? You can say, hey, this thing predicts more of the variability. This might be a better model. So um, it is like little R squared, but for multiple predictors. So here's your rule. Higher R squared equals better model um, because it's more variability that's being predicted. So all things being equal. Uh, higher R squared might be your best model. Then there's parsimony. Um, parsimony is just a fancy word for simple. Um, sometimes it's better to just have simple models. So if you can get a good high R squared and you can get a simpler model, like instead of, you know, 10 predictors, I can get pretty close to that, to the R squared with only five. Maybe that five is better because it's simpler and we like simple models. So, um, this would be, you're looking for um, a good prediction, but with fewer, the fewest number of predictors. That would be using the criteria of parsim, parsim, parsimony. So fewer predictors without a big drop in your R squared, that might be a better model. Okay, so if you can get that. And then finally, we've got practicality. So um, models that use predictors that are easy to get might be the better models uh, is basically the rule here. So um, like if you if if you you had a, a choice of models and one of them you had to pay like for the MMPI to get it graded each time to use it as a predictor, but you got something that doesn't use MMPI and it's free, 
maybe that's a better model okay so this is totally subjective is there one of these predictors that's easier or people are you know it's not you know 200 questions it's only five maybe that's a better model the one that uses the five so the general rule is models excluding predictors that are more difficult or expensive to get might be better models so those are the criteria for how you know what is your best model um, because now we have more than one predictor in our models we also need criteria for how do you know what are the most important predictors in your most your best model so uh, how that is called evaluating your uh, predictor variables and what are the criteria we use to know sort of what are the most important variables for predicting this uh, in this this equation uh, or model that I've chosen so um, how do you know well, the first thing is something called betas. So betas print out, they were, they were there when we were doing the simple linear regression as well. And uh, they're also called standardized coefficients and they allow you to compare the relative importance of different predictors in the model. Um, they're basically kind of like Z-scores really. So bigger ones are more, I guess, whether they're positive or negative. So the bigger they are, um, from largest to smallest, uh, the more important that particular uh, variable or predictor is for uh, the overall model. So higher absolute value indicates more influence in the model. That is one way to know what is your more, most important predictor in your models, or at least order them or rank them, is by looking at the betas. So um, not my favorite way. Um, I like this one. So this is called your squared semi-partial correlations. And um, what's cool about this is uh it's the unique contribution or they indicate the unique contribution that each predictor uh provides the model so what you uh proportion of unique variability each predictor accounts for by itself so to me it's it's sort of really clear and i can actually understand the problem with the betas is i don't understand like really what they are towards these ones i'm like yeah so it, it's just r squared again for an individual predictor and it tells you the unique variability that it predicts. So um, <clears throat> it is the amount the R squared is reduced if you were to remove that particular predictor from your model. And so on your output, SPSS prints this thing called part correlation, um, and uh, you square it to get uh, squared semi-partial correlation. So uh, you, ha you have to do it by hand, but it's not that bad. So this one makes sense. The higher the R squared semi-partial, um, that means the predictor is more important for your model. It predicts more unique variability, interdependent variable. So um, you can use either one. I'm just telling you, I don't really understand betas. Like it's fast, you can go, that's more important, but you can't really sort of uh, put a value on it. Like, you know, if, if one thing is 0.58 and one's 0.4, you know the 0.58 is better, but like, by how much you know you, you don't get that sort of like meaning like you do here by saying it it accounts for additional five percent of variability it makes sense to me all right so that's it let's go ahead and do a work example of linear regression this is actually not too bad i think you'll find we are indeed going to do the example of the college students uh getting lit on the weekend so uh it's from someone's actual dissertation and so the DV is the average number of alcoholic drinks that were consumed per week. The eight potential pre predictive variables are those we talked about earlier, the family uh, conflict score. So higher score, more conflict than the family they came from. Uh, the parental drinking inventory. So this is how much their parents drank. So you think that might be a good predictor, <laughs> right? So uh, three to eight are the parenting styles of the mother and the father, again, you get permissive, authoritarian, and authoritative. And like one of these is good and I can never get it right. I think authoritative is like the positive sort of one. Permissive, you're sort of chill, you're chill maybe too chill. Authoritarian is like uh, strict, I think. Don't quote me, not a psychologist or not this kind of psychologist. So uh, same thing for the father. This is what the data look like. Each person is a row. So this first person, for example, drinks on average three alcoholic drinks per week. Um, and then it's got all the different scores that we could use as potential predictors on their conflict, their drinking inventory, their permissiveness of the mother, permissiveness of the father, 
authoritarianness of the mother, authoritarianness of the father, and tativeness of the mother, and authoritativeness of the father. Here's our means. Um, why do you think we might need these? Well, the short answer is table one, which is just sort of part of life now, okay? Um, table one is uh, always in every write-up moving forward, and it's means and standard deviations of continuous variables, that is interval or ratio, and it's frequencies of other variables, usually uh, uh, dichotomous ones, sex, that sort of thing. So step one to building a regression equation predicting um, uh, why these kids drink or what, what things predict why these kids drink uh, is to do a big old correlation matrix. So hopefully you remember how to do these. Um, you cannot use the correlations that come out as part of the regression procedure. You have to run it in the core procedure, the correlation procedure, like we've been doing for, you know, um, a couple months. So why? Well, the correlations that come out of the regression procedure are one-tailed correlations. And um, we don't really have one-tailed hypotheses here, right? We're just sort of saying, which of these things predicts? I don't care what direction it is. Like, um, I want to know which, which are the best predictors. That's, that's really a two-tailed hypothesis. You can't use the ones that come out of regression. So there, I said like four times. So um, these are the ones that come out of regression. Do you see anything weird? That says sig one-tailed in that bottom left side there. So wrong. Don't use these. And you made Cookie Monster mad. All right. So um, we're going to use two-tailed ones and correlate and bivariate, and we get this monster. But at least they're two-tailed significances, which are more correct. There are our correlations in that first column with average drinking, the thing we want to predict, our DV, and scooting down that column and seeing what is at least significantly associated with how much college students drank. Uh, we got drinking inventory total. I think that's how much their parents drank. It's positive, right? Uh, significant 0.284 um, if your parents drink more they tend to drink more not shocked all right um, permissiveness of the mother 0.248 two stars significant uh, uh, kids who came from uh, mothers who are more permissive in their parenting style tend to drink more positive correlation one goes up the other goes up father significance it's not as strong 0.184 but uh, same same thing uh, College students who had more permissive fathers also tend to drink more. And scooting down the column, nothing else is statistically significant, right? There's a couple things that are close, like tat mom, tat of month, authoritativeness of the mom, I guess, but technically not less than 0.05. So typically, you would also talk about the ones that are uh, significant among your predictors themselves uh, and how those are related. And so, um, but first step is what's the most strongly associated with average drink, and you kind of write it up in your APA write-up. So be wary again of uh, correlations between predictors that are very, very strong. So um, be wary of that. All right, so we know which variables we think are gonna end up being good predictors. Um, but the way multiple regression works is it's not just a once and done sort of thing like the, the pretty much everything we've done before this where you just do it one way. Um, we're going to build multiple models. We're going to have SPSS do the enter, the stepwise, and the backwards. So this is the linear regression menu in SPSS. And notice what's in the dependent box there. It's average drink. So that is the average number of drinks these college students uh, were drinking a week. In dependence, it looks like there's only one, two, three in there, but if you look over at the little slider on the right side of that box, um, you'll see that actually all eight variables are in there. So all eight are in there, even though they weren't strongly correlated. Um, <clears throat> we're going to see if uh, they and any of them end up being good predictors, even though they weren't strongly related. Remember, some of them are sort of borderline-y, and uh, this, this process is a little bit of magic. So sometimes you, you put in one variable, and suddenly this other one turns out to be a really good predictor. Don't ask me how it happens. I just teach stats. <laughs> so um, we're going to build all three. So all three are, uh, of our, uh, all eight predictors are in that independence box. And then um, that little method, the def 
uh, box the default is enter but notice you can see stepwise in there and you can see backward in there um, those are the three we're gonna do we do them one at a time so we'll run it three times we're just gonna change the method click OK go back in there change the method to stepwise click OK go back in there change the method to backward and click OK and once we get those three we're gonna do a comparison of the different models that ran and try to pick the best model so here is the output for the enter uh, analysis this is what you get you get this little thing called variables entered removed which is uh, what happened at each step and notice in the variables entered box there it's got all eight predictors and it tells you the method is enter and it's important because this is how you figure out like wh which output am I looking at it tells you under method so I'll put all eight variables in and you can see um, the dependent variables average drink so then you get model summary and there's some goodies there this is where you get uh, R squared, for example. Oh gosh, I didn't even know. Oh, yes, so it tells you to put it all up. Oh, there we go. R squared. That's the R squared uh, for this particular model. It's almost 0.19. So about 19%, if you turn it into a percent of the variability in average uh, drinks per week, can be predicted by all eight of the uh, independent variables combined. So those six things about their parents, how much their parents drank, or par parents themselves, how much their parents drank, and uh, the uh, uh, FES. So um, <clears throat> the in this table that's called ANOVA, uh, this is an analysis of variance that tests whether overall the model significantly predicts average drinks in this case. So if the SIG is less than 0.05, the answer is yes. This model with eight predictors in it does significantly predict a, a, big, a big chunk of uh, average drinks per week. So the answer is yes, the SIG there is less than 0.05. So this is the, the money table here. This is uh, what actually shows uh, the regression coefficients, the betas, which ones are significant. See it on the far right there, you got part, that's that thing we're gonna square and we get uh, squared semi-partial correlations, that is the unique contribution of each uh, predictor, etc. So these are your betas. We talked about betas as a way to figure out what are the most important predictors in a model. And basically absolute value suggests that yes, that is the a more important variable for predicting in this case average drink, it says it below the table, than the other ones. So which one is the biggest? It looks like it's D in total, which is drinking inventory total. That's how much their parents drank. Uh, following that, it looks like absolute value is permissiveness of the mother at 0 0.210, then 0 0.186, authoritativeness of the mom, um, 0 0.15, uh, authoritativeness of the father, it's kind of interesting. Um, and then, then and only then do we get up to uh, permissiveness of the father. All right, so those are your standardized regression coefficients, and that is how you figure out what the most important predictors are, it's one way. The significance column tells you whether each individual predictor significantly, actually does significantly predict variability in the dependent variable. If the SIG is less than 0.05, the answer is yes, it sure does. Um, if the SIG is greater than 0.05, it tells you that particular predictor does not really do that much predicting. So, you know, take a look at 0.597 in there, third one from the bottom. Authoritarianness of the father does not do much predicting of how much kids drank. Finally, on the end here, you get those parts. Uh, these are part correlations. If you square them, you get squared, or excuse me, these are semi-partial correlations. Um, and if you square them, you get squared semi-partial correlations. What the hell are those? Those are those things that will tell you the percent of variability that that particular predictor uniquely predicts in the DV, in this case, average drinks. So, now let's check out the output for the next model is the stepwise. Remember, that's one where it'll put the best one in, then it'll put the next best one in, and sometimes it'll take one out, and it'll try to go sort of back and forth iteratively and build the best model for you. So the output kind of looks the same, but note that um, instead of there being just one step, there's uh, in the upper left hand box for variables and to remove, there's one, two. So you always want to go to the final step for this stuff. So you'd want to go to that second step. And what did it do? So at step one, it, it entered drinking inventory total. 
um, <clears throat> at and by the way see it says stepwise up there uh, in the method box that's again how you can tell which output you're looking at at step two it then entered the permissiveness of the mother and if you think back to that last model those were the two strongest predictors in the answer model so um, <clears throat> oops it, it went through two steps here's our r squared so we had point roughly one nine before now we have 0.15 so we've lost about four percent of variability but yeah, there's only two variables, <laughs> which is kind of nice, right? So instead of having to collect eight variables, I can get pretty damn close to 0.19 uh, with just two. I'd say that's pretty good. So these two, and note that we're at step two there, model one, model two, we're at step two, because you always go to the final step. So overall, um, it does tell you what the predictors are below the table in that final model. and. Uh, again, about 15% of the variability in weekly alcohol consumption can be predicted by just these two things, how much your parents drank and how permissive your mom was. So there's our, um, we get a new thing in this table called R squared change, which tells you how much R squared changed. I know that's shocking, <laughs> but um, that's literally what it tells you. So that first step 0.081 means uh, drinking inventory total uh, accounted for 8% of the variability in um, uh, the uh, average drinks. Then it added the next variable, which was what? I don't know. Look up top. Permissiveness of the mother per month. month. That added about another 6.7% uh, to the R squared. And so um, <clears throat> overall, those two things together uh, are the only two that are in um, our equation. So it's, it's nice to... You get this R-squared chain so you can sort of see how much is added along the way by including additional predictors. Went from 8, then we went to 6.7. And um, note, then it stopped. It didn't find any more variables that were good predictors, so stepwise stopped and didn't add the other 6. So uh, again, R-squared change is the addition of R-squared at each step of the model. Always go to the last step. Um, speaking of last step, we don't go to the line one for the NOVA, we go to line two, and again, it tests the same thing. Does this model with two predictors significantly account for variability in the DV, average drinks? Yes, it sure does. SIGs less than 0.05. Let's check out uh, the table of co. Here's your table of coefficients. And so again, go to step two, go to the final step, don't go to step one you get your betas. So what's the most important predictor? Which one of those is bigger? It's drinking inventory total, how much their parents drink, followed by how permissive their mom was. Are they significant? That is, does each of these actually significantly predict uh, the dependent variable? Um, we look at our sig values and the answer is, yep, each one does. And then this thing called the constant, which you might remember from last semester. Do not forget these parts over here. Again, if we square those, we're, we're not going to do what we're going to do with our final model, whichever one we pick. Those uh, squared parts will give you squared semi-partial correlations, which is the unique contribution uh, that each variable predicts in the DV, drinking inventory and permissiveness of the mother. And they're kind of close. All right. Now let's look at the final way we did this. We did a backwards model. Again, this is where SPSS just throws everything in and takes out the junk and just leaves in the good stuff. So remember, stepwise started with nothing is to put in good stuff and sometimes takes out bad stuff. Um, this puts everything in and then just sort of takes out the bad and leaves the good in. But it results in different models sometimes. There's our output. Um, it went through four steps. You see that? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So what did it do at the first step in that upper corner? It uh, added everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables were put in. At step two, it took out conflicts. See, it says variables removed. At step three, it took out authoritarianness of the father. At step four, it took out authoritarianness of the mother. And then it stopped. Okay, so step four is the final model. So, um, again, you can see that it does the enter and then it does backward. That's how you can tell which one you're at. So, how about the R squared? Final step is 0.18. Whoa, that's really close to what we got uh, with our enter model, right? We were about 18.4% of variability, super close, but with half the number of predictors. So, that seems good. Um, <clears throat> so, 18% of the variability is predicted by 
five predictors. So yeah, I took out three, sorry, five predictors. <laughs> and there's our final number. Uh, authoritativeness of the father, permissiveness of the father. Who even know those were related, right? Drink and inventory, permissiveness of the mother, and authoritativeness of the mother. Those are the ones that are in there. All right, so it gives you again the R squared change at each step. And here you can see that um, it, it threw everything in. You get 18.9.189 which is what we got with enter. And then it took out uh, conflict at step two and the R squared change was zero. Then it took out authoritarianness of the father. The R squared was basically zero. It's 0 0.001. Um, it's not changing much. So it's taking out things that don't really do much predicting. All right, and our final model does uh, the model with these five predictors significantly predict variability and how much these kids were drinking. Uh, yeah, sure it does. P is less than 0.05. Here's our coefficients table. Not that you can read it, but make sure you go to the final step. Um, there's our betas. Which one is most important? Let's see. It looks like it is drinking inventory total again at 0.307. Second most important, permissiveness of the mother. That's not shocking at 0.225. Absolute value is then authoritativeness of the mother, etc. That is the ordering of importance of predictors. You can keep going. Um, do they each significantly predict variability in the DV? Um, that's really small, but they all look like they're less than 0.05, except the one called constant, which is where, uh, if you think back, where the, um, this line intersects the uh, y-axis. So uh, who cares? you got to keep it in. So we leave it there. So um, yeah, they all, each variable does uniquely predict uh, some variability in our average drinks per week. And then again, if we square these parts, we will get uh, squared semi-partial correlations. That is the unique variability predicted by each variable in the model. Okay. So which model is best? Let's go through those three criteria and try to pick which model is the best. So remember model, uh, criteria one is the model that accounts for the most variability in the DV um, might be the best model, right? So higher R squared is best. So here's our enter model, and we got 0.189 for our R squared. There's our stepwise, we got 0.148 for our R squared. And here's our backwards, it's 0.184. So, you know, one and and three are really close, and turn backwards, right? Really close. And you don't have to use three, anyway, we'll get there. That's the next criterion. So putting them in order, enter accounted for the most variability, um, stepwise was third, and backwards was second. Does that make sense? I hope variability accounted for. Criteria two, however, is simplicity. Where possible, go with a simple solution. So here's our enter model. And there's, let's see, a bunch of predictors, all of them eight, right? There's our stepwise, there's two predictors, constant, you don't count the constant. Oops, and then there's our backwards, backwards at five, right? So uh, in terms of numbers of predictors, the worst is enter, um, the best would be stepwise, right? It's the simplest, it's just got two, and um, the backwards has uh, five predictors in it. So again, simplest would be stepwise, followed by backward, and then enter. How about criteria three, the subjective one? Like, or some of these are real pain in the butt to get. Um, and so if I can leave them out, it would be a practical, good decision to do so. There's our models, there's our predictors, same thing with stepwise, our two, and there's backward. So are some of these things harder to get than others? Or uh, think of it another way. Would it be easier to get certain predictors here than other ones um, because uh, they take a lot of time to fill out questionnaires? Or um, I, I think so. If you think about it, um, having to uh, fill out stuff for both your mom and your dad would kind of be a pain in the butt. So uh, up top, it uses mother and father and enter. And that one that stepwise, it uses drinking inventory total and then the permissiveness of the mother. You don't even have to ask the dad questions on that one, right? At the bottom for backwards, it's got father and mother in there. So you'd have to ask them both. So I'd say, you know, simple-wise, 
stepwise all the way. That seems to be the simplest one to get. Dude, it's two questionnaires. Um, followed by backward and um, uh, we only, and then finally uh, the enter, which is sort of always the worst of this because it's literally throw the kitchen sink in and leave it there. So again, stepwise only requires data for one parent. That seems more practical to me. So which model's the best? Um, I've filled out this table and you'll note you have a similar table on your SBSS assignment for this week. Um, you just fill in the R squared from each model, number of predictors for, for each model, and the ease of uh, getting those predictors to sort of rank them one, two, three for each model. And here's what I got. So enter at the highest R squared, but it was based on eight predictors. Stepwise had the lowest R squared, but dude, only two predictors. That's kind of attractive. Backwards was in the middle. It was awfully close at 18%. I'm, I'm kind of rounding here, just keep it easy, um, based on five predictors. So what is the best one? Well, um, I like the simple one. So uh, having done this for a while, three percentage points, there's between 15 and 18% of variability in drinks is not that big of a deal. So personally, I'd go for stepwise. It has um, the most parsimonious model, right? Only two predictors. Um, the R squared wasn't bad. Like, yeah, it could be a little bit higher, but to not have to collect that data, it's a pretty good model um, on the father, for example. Uh, it has the lowest number of predictors to achieve that R squared, and it only requires parenting data from the mother. So I consider it my favorite. So just so you guys know, um, uh, you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> so... Um, I like that model. You might like backwards. I will tell you, enter is wrong. Um, enter has variables in there that actually, it leaves them in even if they're not predicting, which was a waste of time and a waste of uh, your participants' time. So enter is like pretty much never the right answer uh, for this. So it's basically a choice between stepwise and backwards because um, at least those don't include junk variables. So, Part one of your SBSS homework assignment is to run for that assignment, uh, what you're predicting there, a stepwise, excuse me, an enter, a stepwise, and a backwards regression model. You are predicting authoritarianism, authoritarianism based on the, the other variables that are in the file. Do it right now, and um, then we will go over part two. That is the second part of this lecture to see. Um, I want to make sure you get on the right path. So go ahead and run those three models. It literally takes, you know, five minutes. It's really fast to do this. Um, <clears throat> I want you to fill in the table that's on your SPSS handout and um, post your model choice in Canvas. Tell me which one you picked. And using the three model cri uh, choice criteria, that is R squared, parsimony, and practicality, um, be ready to argue for the model that you think is the best choice to predict authoritarianism on the homework problem. And then in part two of the homework assignment, um, again, only watch part two after you've run the models, otherwise you kind of miss out on the learning experience, okay? So do go ahead and run it and fill out that table and be ready to argue, uh, uh, post your choice on Canvas and be ready to argue uh, which model you picked. Um, we will then learn how to determine the which predictors are the most important for your model and how to write up your a, uh, APA format uh, linear regression analysis. So go and do that and I will see you in lecture two.